San La Muerte is a spiritual and religious entity. The belief and worship of San La Muerte has its stronghold in the poor towns and prisons of Argentina. It's an odd thing. The figure arose from a mix between the indigenous religions and the Roman Catholicism that the conquistadors introduced, or rather forced upon the original citizens of the continent. Sala Muerte and its evolution is certainly an interesting and historical topic. But here on my channel, I like to focus on other types of history. The historical events of today's first feature took place about a decade ago, in Argentina. A serial killer arose in the slums of Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina. His name was Marcelo Antelo, and after his capture, he would attribute his four confirmed murders as sacrifices to San La Muerte. But personally, I believe that his religious fantasies was just a part of the pie. His childhood and his addiction to drugs and the poverty he had endured throughout his life is the cause in my opinion. San La Muerte is just a symptom. Another thing I want to say about Marcelo Antello is that in my eyes he is an example of a serial killer molded by life around him. I don't think he was born to be a serial killer. I don't think that certain parts of his brain was to blame. It was the life he led that enabled him to become a serial killer. Many people when they talk about the cause of why serial killers exist usually ask the question nurture versus nature. Are they born to become serial killers or is it their upbringing that forms them? And I don't understand why it can't be both. There is plenty of examples of serial killers with good upbringings and good lives, like Dennis Rader, Jeffrey Dahmer and so on. Those are examples of nature. Then there's the ones that are made into serial killers, like Marcelo Antello and, in my opinion, Joanna Dennehy. Then there is other examples where the nurture enhances the already existing nature of a budding serial killer, like Ed Kemper. So in my eyes it's not a question of nurture versus nature, it's a question of whether this specific individual is the result of nurture, nature or both. I hope I have made my thoughts clear, if not, let me know. Marcelo grew up in a household riddled with abuse, drug addictions and alcoholism. He was only a teenager when he himself became addicted to cocaine paste. Eventually he was kicked out of his home by his mother. All alone in the world, there was still a location of solace for young Marcelo, his uncle. Marcelo loved his uncle. He had always been good to the young boy. He had always been there for him when his own parents would do nothing but abuse and degrade him. But he wouldn't be staying with his uncle for long. You see, one day his uncle had gotten into a fight with someone. The injuries he sustained from the altercation was so severe that he later passed away from them, leaving Marcelo once again alone in the slums of Buenos Aires. Life went on though. Marcelo found a girlfriend whom he impregnated, but she too kicked him out. He had been too abusive to her. He had picked up the habits of his parents and his peers. Marcelo tried to find another source of solace. It was religion. He would go to a church and pray every day that he could have the power and strength to change his ways, but the power and strength never came. He kept up his ways, doing drugs and getting into dangerous fights and altercations with drug dealers and thugs. He even during this time lost a kidney because of a gunshot wound he had sustained. By early 2010, Marcelo was more desperate than he had ever been before. He was 22 years old and he needed money. That's when his first attack occurred. It wasn't anything unusual considering the neighborhood, but it was the beginning of something. Jorge Diaz was walking along the neighborhood when Marcelo Antello appeared in front of him. He demanded money and just after he had done so, he shot Diaz in the leg. Nothing more really happened in his first attack. 
He was arrested for this and jailed, but it didn't take long before he got out of prison. Why he was released in the first place is beyond me. Rodrigo Escura was a 27-year-old philosophy student. He still lived with his father, and just like many others in the area, he was addicted to drugs. One day though, he came across Marcelo. It was April 11, 2010. Marcelo was at that point leading his own little gang, consisting of boys in their mid-teens. Rodrigo had recently began therapy to end his addiction, to turn his life around, but instead what he got was the end. Marcelo and his gang confronted Rodrigo in an alleyway under the pretense of robbing him. Rodrigo did as Marcelo had demanded, but it didn't matter. Marcelo and Tello had already made up his mind. Rodrigo was going to die. After Rodrigo had given Marcelo his possessions, Marcelo raised his gun, the barrel pointed towards his heart, and Marcelo and Tello at that moment took his first life. It was what you could call a clean kill. Rodrigo died on the spot, shot once in the chest. Marcelo wasn't the brightest bulb in the box though. He had committed murder in front of several witnesses, and the cold-hearted murder had even been recorded by one person. But despite that, Marcelo would have more time to cement his place in Argentinian history. The next attack occurred on June 24th, 2010. The victim this time was actually someone that Marcelo knew, a man who had once been his roommate. His name was Dario Romero, and on that warm summer day, he was planning on playing some football, or soccer for you Americans out there. Marcelo was just cruising through the neighborhood when he spotted Dario. He immediately shouted out his name and approached Dario with a shotgun in his hands. He fired once, lodging several pellets in Dario Romero's head and then he left. Dario Romero survived the attack and Marcelo was even arrested after this attack, but again, for whatever reason, he wasn't detained for long. It was still summer, it was still 2010, and Marcelo was after shooting someone, a free man. It was August 8th, and this time he again went after someone he had a connection to. His name was Jorge Mancia, another former roommate of Marcelo. Marcelo wanted revenge on Mancia, because as Marcelo's drug addiction had grown out of control, Mancia had kicked him out of their home. Marcelo and Tello marched up to the front door. He rang the doorbell and readied himself with a gun in his hand. Mancia opened the door and had no time to react to his visitor before he fell to the floor, shot point blank. Marcelo was on a small-scale spree that day, as he only hours after the murder of Mancia shot another man, a mechanic Marcelo had conducted business with. His name was Mario, but he would escape, running after the first shot, and Marcelo simply abandoned the chase. On August 15, 2010, only one week after his second murder, Marcelo and Tello randomly came across two friends standing together. Their names was Pablo Saniuk and Marcelo Cabrera. He had now grown used to murder. He had been around it all his life, ever since his childhood, but now he was in charge. He was the one that decided who lived and who died. And on that day, he decided that Pablo and Cabrera was going to die. He first walked up to Pablo, shot him once in the face, dropping him on the spot killing him instantly. Cabrera was shocked and froze for a second or two, and so Marcelo turned towards him and unloaded. He shot him a total of nine times. These are all the confirmed attacks of Marcelo and Tello. In August of 2010, Marcelo was arrested by police after a shootout in the capital of Buenos Aires. He claimed he had killed as an offering to San La Muerte he had promised one murder a week in exchange for protection and prosperity. There were other murders that police believes Marcelo is responsible for. Men found shot and their remains burned, but those have never been confirmed. And I won't speculate as to whether he is responsible for those crimes, 
because most sources are in Spanish and my Spanish is extremely limited. Marcelo was arrested for confirmed victims ever since known as the San La Muerte killer. Daryl Mack was a criminal, a thug. He made his living on the streets and in the early 90s he was making his living as a pimp. One of the working girls he quote unquote managed was Kim Parks. Things had been working relatively smoothly but I suspect that Daryl wasn't exactly a good boss. On April 8, 1994, Kim Parks refused to give up her earnings. This angered Daryl to such an extent that he lunged at her. He began beating Kim Parks into submission and after that he strangled her to death with her own brassiere. After that he took the earnings and left her there. Daryl was arrested not too long after. He would spend many many years in prison. Life on the inside went on for Daryl. For five years everything was fine and dandy for him but in 1999 his past would catch up with him. Semen and DNA samples from a cold case back in 88 was tested and it led right back to Daryl Mack. Betty Jane May was 55 years old. She was a kind-hearted lady. She had a love for cats, loved to listen to music and reading. She was described by relatives that she was very polite but quiet. Betty May had once been married. She had kids whom she loved but after the kids had grown up she and her husband had separated. She lived a calm life. She never hurt anyone. On October 28, 1988, Betty's neighbor Stephen Floyd was knocking on her door. He was going to ask her for a small loan, but as he approached the door he realized that it was open. Stephen could feel that something was wrong, and as he entered he found Betty May kneeling in the bedroom. Her knees on the floor and her upper torso and face resting face down on her bed. Stephen was confused. He called out, but it wasn't until he physically went up to shake Betty May's shoulder that he came to the shocking realization Betty May was dead. She had been murdered. Betty May had put up one hell of a fight with her attacker. She was a small woman, but she wouldn't give up without a fight. Her attacker had beaten her severely. He had raped her and then he had strangled her manually with his own hands. Semen was found inside of Betty May and skin tissue found under her fingernails, tissue belonging to the attacker. But whoever had killed Betty had disappeared. It wasn't anyone she knew. Some stranger had blown through the neighborhood. For over 10 years the murder of Betty May remained unsolved. Her kids, desperate for closure, had to find the one responsible for their mother's murder. Then, one day in 1999, the DNA was retested. A match was made. The match was made because the man to whom the semen and skin tissue belonged was already in prison. It was Daryl Mack, the pimp who had murdered one of his prostitutes in 1994. He denied involvement, but the DNA disagreed. Betty May's kids attended the court they wanted justice for the murder of their mother, and they would get it. Daryl Mack was sentenced to death. He denied involvement for a while, but eventually gave in. He waived his appeals and found solace in Islam. On April 26, 2006, Daryl Mack was strapped to the table. Before the lethal fluid was injected, he was given a last word. He had a big smile on his face and simply said, Allah is great. Then the injection was made and the brutal killer died. Daryl Mack was almost a serial killer. Not a smart one though. He got caught for killing a prostitute because he had no sense of awareness as far as leaving a trail behind him. It did work better with Betty because she had no known connection. She was just a random stranger he had seen and attacked. But he left so much DNA behind. I don't know why he killed Betty, he never as far as I know said why either, but if you look at the attack itself, it's kinda clear 
that it was sexually motivated. This was today's double feature. I originally had another guy planned for the second feature, but I swapped him out. He may get his own ages of murder episode, or he may be a part of another double feature. I haven't decided yet. But until next time, I hope you have enjoyed tonight's double feature.